Why, hello, the internet. Um, so as the people in the room have just heard, uh, tonight is the first night of what's going to be a multi-month course on uh, the different types of meditations that uh, exist and the philosophies behind them. So uh, the first thing we'll do is get into, oh, the first thing we'll do is turn off our cell phones. And if you're uh, doing this online or on YouTube, if you can make sure to shut off, uh, close all the windows besides me and um, all the tabs besides me and silence your phone. And I'll set us a 40 minute timer here. And we'll start by finding the meditation posture. If you get really uh, into meditation, you know, you're going for hours at a time or going on retreat, the particular posture becomes uh, more specific. For our purposes tonight, there's really only two things that matter about the posture. You want to be comfortable enough that you won't need to move. Now, of course, if you do move by accident, um, we will all forgive you. But the goal would actually be to, to sit completely still for the next 40 minutes. So um, some people will want to sit cross-legged on the floor. Many of us can't stay very still cross-legged on the floor. So trying to find a posture where you're minimizing pain and discomfort if your keys are poking you in your pocket, if your belt is too tight, take care of whatever you need about your posture and your outfit now. Oh yeah, there's actually Zafu's over by the door there. And the other thing that's important about the posture is not to be so comfortable that you'll fall asleep. And part of why we sit on the floor is a convention uh, meditation came from early 20th century Asia to the uh, to the United States and Europe, and uh, that was how people sat back then. But, but also, it's it's pretty hard and actually kind of dangerous to fall asleep sitting up on the floor. So, the more tired you are, the more uncomfortable of a posture I would get. So, if you're in the chair, keeping your back off the back of the chair and nice and straight. Similarly, many people find it easier to close your eyes. There's just fewer distractions. And often the floor or the carpet will start doing these like LSD sort of dances if your eyes are open. So it can be easier to do it eyes closed. If you're exhausted, it'll be easy to keep your eyes open. And if it's just your custom to keep your eyes open, Usually the instructions to stare at the floor in front of you. Try not to focus on anything in particular. And the first meditation in our series will be what I always think of as the first meditation, which is breath concentration. So see where you find the breath the easiest. For most people, that's going to be in your nostrils. But if you feel the breath more easily in your throat, in your chest, in your belly, at some point it can be helpful to go to the nose, but uh, for our purposes tonight, it really doesn't matter. So we'll pick wherever the breath is coming, coming into our conscious most, consciousness most easily. And the idea is to put the breath in the front of your attention and to leave everything else in the background. The number one rookie mistake people make in meditation is trying to make your thoughts stop, trying to make your mind quiet and peaceful. And so I'll, I'll warn you, don't try to make your mind quiet. I like to say that twice because I find nobody listens when I say it. Do not try to stop your thoughts. For those of us here at the Dharma Collective, 
it's generally pretty loud outside. There's traffic, there's usually music, there's neighbors upstairs. And you're probably finding it's pretty easy to listen to me, even though there's a lot of noise outside. We hear the traffic outside and realize it has nothing to do with us. It's very easy to ignore the traffic and listen to me. With your thoughts, it's much harder to do that, but it's just the same mental movement. It'll take more practice, but it's the same concept. So what we want to do is put the breath in the front of our attention and leave everything else in the background. It's going to be feelings in your body, images in your mind, emotions, memories. And for most of us, the hardest thing to leave in the background is going to be that rambling voice in your head. It tends to be about a few things. One is like a, a evolutionary or lizard brain desire. So it's going to talk about what you want to eat after this and who you want to hook up with after this. And it's going to do planning and worrying. Very rarely helpful planning. It's usually thinking the same planning thought for the eight millionth time or planning for the zombie apocalypse. It's going to be self-reflecting. Does anybody like you? Remember a stupid thing you said a long time ago? Are you any good at meditation? And for many of my students, the most distracting mental talk is talking about meditation. Oh my God, I love this. This is amazing. I'm so good at this. Oh no, I'm focusing on my thoughts about how good I am at this, which means I'm not good at this. I stink at this. I hate this. Is it okay to get up and leave? Will that be embarrassing? And so what we'll try to do is put all of the thoughts, including and especially thinking about meditation, into maps, you know, am I in stage four of this map, John of 14 of that map, and so on. And try to just ignore all of these. It doesn't matter if the thoughts are going or not. It's actually pretty stressful to try to stop your thoughts or to try to have better thoughts. It feels much nicer to just ignore them. We can hear a loud truck coming by right now. And I actually find these outside noises quite helpful. You can get lost in your thoughts for so long. You really can't get lost in the truck for very long. It just has nothing to do with you. And so I, I like to let those outside sounds be almost like a mindfulness bell, reminding us to come back to the breath in the front.
There's a, a famous sutta in ancient Buddhist text where the Buddha is giving an instruction on the kind of effort to use in meditation. And he says it's like a string on the guitar. Too tight's no good, too loose is no good. My first teacher used this analogy I liked better. It's like holding an egg. Uh, too loose is a mess. Too tight's actually a bigger mess. So what I would invite you to play with for a minute is go up and down with effort. Meaning like, try to really grab onto the breath too much. And for me, my attention gets pretty tight and I feel awful, my head hurts. And then relax, give up, and just sit there. And then try to find that point in the middle that feels balanced enough that the breath is staying in the middle. Not enough that anything hurts or feels tired or you get mad at yourself. Unless you're quite advanced in meditation, probably even then, you won't be able to keep the breath in the center of your attention. You'll get lost over and over. So I, I wouldn't set the goal as keeping it there. That, that actually makes you disappointed in yourself pretty quickly. <coughs> the big moment of success in fact, if you're newer at meditation, really the only moment of success is the one where you notice that you're lost. So I would think of it like this. You're mindful, you're conscious, you're aware. You decide what you're going to do with your mind. At some point, you become unmindful, unconscious, unaware. You have no idea what's happening. There's nothing you can do in that moment. There's not really any you there to do a thing. And so you can't really help getting lost. You're pretty much absent when it happened and while it was happening. When you notice that you're lost, 
that means the mindfulness has come back. That is specifically the muscle you want to train. When you're brand new at this, particularly if no one's guiding, it's not hard to get lost for 10 minutes. As you practice, it starts getting hard to get lost for more than 20 seconds all that often. You just get good at noticing what's happening. So if we want to set anything as our goal for the meditation, I suggest we set that. Notice that you're lost. And if you keep practicing this in a month from now, Notice you lost quicker than you're noticing it today. I just like to extend a little gratitude to those loud noises. That really sounds like the world's cheapest mindfulness bell. Some meditations will do where as this different content comes up in the mind, try to interact with it in some way, try to heal it. In this practice, there's this uh, like delightful freedom of anti-healing. We just don't care what comes up in the mind. 
I'm not going to try to fix it at all. And actually, for now, not as a life philosophy, of course, but as a philosophy for these 40 minutes, we're going to just try to ignore it and not care about it. This is my, my favorite trick for breath meditation. My favorite trick is if you're trying too hard to focus, your head gets tense. So there, there's two parts to the trick. <clears throat> One is to try relaxing your head. And you'll find it's not just the scalp or the neck, it's not just the outside of your head. But you'll probably find they're not really muscle knots, I don't think. Uh, you know, there's no sensation deep inside your head, no nerves deep inside your head. But it at least feels like muscle knots actually in your head. <clears throat> I don't know what the anatomy is there, but so one is trying to relax anything in your head that will relax. And part two of the trick is try to really like the breath. So I, I find two ways to like the breath. One is noticing all the delicious sensations of the breath. In breath feels like cold and delicious to me. Out breath feels like warm and almost kind of tickly. One thing is to find those aspects of the breath that feel really nice. 
And the other is to notice how nice it feels to ignore that idiotic monologue that goes on and on in your head all day. Or even just to ignore the sounds in the room or, or whatever it is. That feeling of not having to deal with anything. And I find that really pleasant too. So the trick is relax the head and enjoy the breath. I usually find this makes my concentration much deeper than the more standard effortful way of catching the breath. And it certainly feels a lot nicer. One of those thoughts about meditation that gets distracting is thinking about the time. Particularly if you're newer at meditation or haven't been practicing much lately. It's easy to feel like he said 40 minutes, we've already been here three hours. Obviously his clock stopped. We'll ignore all thoughts, especially thoughts about meditation including any thoughts about the time. It's actually a really helpful practice <clears throat> to imagine that you don't know how long we're going to sit here. Well, of course, in reality you do. But if you pretend that we're going to sit here and, until I say it's time to go and it could be an hour, two hours, three hours, the mind really settles in and lets go 
if we give up on the idea that we'll go somewhere soon, this will be over. <coughs> I often find the mind like lusting for the end. It's like, well, the bell will ring and then we'll be happy. Well, what's so great about the bell ringing? <laughs> Nothing especially awesome is gonna happen. So we, we get that feeling of like settling in to the mind and body. It comes from pretending we have no idea how long this is going to go for.
you're getting into a place where the breath is starting to feel pretty stable, what you can try next <clears throat> is looking for different components of the breath. So what does the first half of the in-breath feel like? What does the second half feel like? Hi everybody. So normally we go right into breakout groups, but I want to give a very brief Dharma talk <coughs> on uh, on breath meditation. So I said that I, I always use this as my first practice that I teach people. And the reason I like it so much is an intro practice, either for somebody who's new at meditation for real or somebody feels new at meditation today. You know, that the thing we've been doing this for five years, but uh, your mind is working today as though you've never done it before. With the breath practice, it's really easy 
to tell whether you're doing what you're meant to be doing. <clears throat> so, you know, you lose your mindfulness. Suddenly you remember, oh, so you're meditating. And that question of am I on the breath or not, it's very easy to answer. And so it's why I think it's a nice intro uh, to building up that initial level of mindfulness. Um, concentration also, um, my, my longest teacher was a, a guy called Chula Dasa. Longest in terms of the amount of time he was my teacher. He wasn't especially long. He was actually a rather short fellow. But um, <laughs> he would describe himself as looking like Yoda. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there was something I was going to tell you about Chula Dasa, and as I mentioned to those of you who uh, were in the room, my, uh, my godson was born in the middle of the night, and I didn't really sleep last night, and I forgot the thing that I was going to tell you um, <clears throat> about Chula Dasa. Oh, so he used to talk about um, unification of mind, the idea that your mind is usually doing a whole bunch of contradictory things at the same time. And so another great benefit of concentration is it helps unify the mind. It causes, and you probably notice that when you first start meditating, your mind is like thinking a thousand stupid thoughts at the same time. And as you continue practicing, it's not necessarily that your mind gets quiet, but maybe it's saying like three stupid things at the same time, you know? A lot more of your mind is, is focused on the breath. But one more thing Chula Dasa used to say, and, and breath meditation was really his, his shtick, he wrote a book about it called The Mind Eliminated, um, <clears throat> was that breath meditation works like a lubricant. So if you read the map of what happens when you focus on the breath, you know, there are some hard parts for sure, but mostly it just gets like nicer and nicer and nicer. And if you read like the progress of insight or mastery in the core teachings, if you read what happens if you meditate without any breath attention, it doesn't necessarily get nicer and nicer. It's actually pretty wild. So <clears throat> uh, these are three reasons that I particularly like this one. I think that was three. Uh, it's very easy if you are feeling like a beginner in the moment. Uh, it helps unify the mind, which also helps insight percolate, you know, um, you learn these awesome things about how your mind works in meditation, and you're like a completely different person for, if you're lucky, like a week, sometimes it's five minutes, and then everything goes right back like it had been. Uh, this unification of mind helps the insights be more available. So it, it's uh, you know easy to tell if you're doing what you're meant to be doing. It helps the mind unify, which helps insights become more readily available. And it makes the whole path of meditation more like lubricated, more pleasant. <clears throat> so um, thanks for coming to the first one of these. Um, Han, if you wouldn't mind stopping the recorder over there, we will say goodbye to our friends on YouTube. Bye, YouTube people.